Curtis, great to see you. We have to do it this way now because of the... During this global pandemic, an era of social distancing, I spoke with Curtis from our studios in Washington, D.C. Thanks for coming. He's the founder of a consulting firm that helps organizations implement public and private cultural partnerships. The bottom line about cultural diplomacy is it's profoundly human. Um, wherever you go, China, the United States, Italy, Botswana, pick a country, everybody has one thing, three things in common, uh, their language or their dialect, their land, and their food, their cuisine. And all of these things grow out of ancient, ancient realities. You just luck of the draw, your people happen to be born on a Polynesian island or you know, in southern Mexico with volcanoes. And you have soil that grows certain things. So as a result, those food items become your food items. And then your language, you develop words to describe the food items. And suddenly, all of that is your basic identifier as a human being and your group. And then culture grows from that. So everybody's got it, and that's the basis of cultural diplomacy, is it's a way that countries, nations, peoples, but ultimately also individuals, formally get together, they discover things about one another that they have in common, and then they build projects based on those that are bilateral projects. They're things that are a product of both peoples telling their stories together as they learn about one another. So cultural diplomacy is profoundly human, and it's an experience that people share to tell their stories one side or the other side. Uh, you talk about being an archeologist, an anthropologist. I suspect when you started out, out of university, uh, you didn't suspect you'd be sitting across from me talking about cultural diplomacy. So how does that journey start where it did and end up uh, where you're sitting here chatting with me? Well, okay, no, it's, it goes way, way back. Uh, it's, it's family. Uh, my dad did this for a living. Uh, my father was actually the first person in the family back in the 70s and 80s doing things with China. Uh, my mother as well was in Los Angeles working with ping pong diplomacy. At that time, she was on the Los Angeles Committee to connect with China. So I grew up in a family where there was always this very profound sense of the importance of connecting with other people, of not just living in the United States and having an American reality. So that was sort of you know, milk from the beginning and, nut and nutrients. Um, I did choose classical archaeology, so I lived in Italy for many, many years. And I learned, even as a teenager living in Italy, that it was really important to be able to go to a little village, just the joy of going to some place where you could get into people's food, you could learn their language, the, the, the things that animated them, that made them happy and gave them joy, and then share in that. And I think for your, your audience, for everybody watching this, just forget cultural diplomacy. Imagine that you're on a, you're a tourist, you're going someplace, you know, you've heard about Southern Mexico and there are these amazing rituals going back to Maya times and there's a, a festival that you wanna to go to. And just by accident, you happen to meet the right people in Chiapas or in Oaxaca or wherever. And they're nice, you're nice, you're open, they're open. And suddenly you're invited to go to things that you've never been to before, would never have imagined going to before. And there's that magical click moment that you're in it. And it's, it's one of the great, delightful human experiences. And so in terms of cultural diplomacy, doing archeology span and anthropology in graduate school and having that over and over and over, it's something that you kind of come to crave almost. You know, that it's, it's such a great human feeling of connection with others and being able to do it. And you know, you do this as well. I mean, this is, you know, we, we share this, Mike, that, that being able to go to faraway places or have people from faraway places come here to our home and connect with them and make a global community, that's profoundly satisfying. Curtis has a long history of working with China on various cultural projects. He's the former director of the David M. Rubenstein National Center for White House History. Before that, he held the position of Senior Vice President for Arts and Cultural Programs at the nonprofit Meridian International Center, where he established its Center for Cultural Diplomacy. It uses visual and performing arts to strengthen engagement between the U.S. and global leaders. I remember uh, meeting you, I mean, years ago at Meridian, and there was an exhibit there, and I was just kind of walking around in awe and, and I wonder about somebody like yourself who's putting exhibits together, what's the payoff for you? I mean, is it watching people kind of, you know, reading and gazing and, and just kind of a sense of wonder? I mean, what's a payoff for you? The payoff for me is in dealing with any of these 
potentially really wonderful experiences that one can be proud of and say, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley and here I am in Beijing working in this you know, august, extraordinary situation. And it's, it's, it's a very good feeling. But there's a certain amount of humility and anonymity that needs to come into good cultural diplomacy. You need to be able to be at a venue, at a place where all of your hard work and all of everybody else's hard work comes together and just stand in a corner, maybe you're lucky, you get to give some remarks for three minutes or something and say, we did this and thank your staff and thank the people you've worked with elsewhere. But the payoff is standing in a corner with a glass of water or a glass of wine or something, you know, balancing a plate with an egg roll on it and watching 300 people, many of whom you just don't know, all in a room or rooms or all in a performance auditorium, all enjoying something, all talking to each other at intermission, isn't that great, didn't you love the dancers, and just being invisible and saying, we did all of this and our payoff is that all of these people are liking it and they're talking to each other and they're gonna go out and spread the message. And so cultural diplomacy has been done. Yeah, it sure has. Underserved regions, you, you brought it up. Um, you know, we, we often think about a, a huge exhibit in New York or Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. or Beijing, as you mentioned, and, and Shanghai. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to, to hit those underserved regions. How do you, how do you go about that, and why mm -hmm. is it important? Well, it's important on a couple of levels. First of all, we're maybe lucky and unlucky, or fortunate and unfortunate here in Washington or New York or L.A., San Francisco, because there's too much to do. And you know, one day COVID will end and, and there will be too much to do again. Uh, you know, right now there isn't. But you, know, you look at our paper here, the Washington Post, and you know, on any given weekend, there are potentially 100 different things to do. And I know that my response often is just to give up and just say, there are too many things to do, I'm gonna stay home. You know, there are things to do here that I should do or do one small thing. But in underserved regions or just places outside of major urban centers, maybe there are two really cogent, important things to do. And people really cleave to those. They love their community arts center. They care about their museum because it's their, it's their window on the world. It's their window on themselves. And taking it a step sideways, when we talked before about difficult moments, you know, when, when countries kind of rub against each other in, in difficult or challenging ways, we're here in Washington, we see it come, we see it go. People in Beijing do as well or in other, other urban centers. But if you're in a smaller place and you're, you're outside of kind of the whole realm of diplomacy or politics, things can seem a lot more terrible than they might be. And that's one of the reasons that it's really important to get you know, the people to people connection with cultural diplomacy is to find ways to get people together. So in my case, exhibits, what the exhibits are, are a focal point. It's a thing. It's a, it's a tangible object or series of objects that goes in a place. And then you build out around the place with food, with dance, with people, with education, with outreach to kids. All of these different things with you know, China's famous intangible cultural heritage, all of this wealth of 5,000 years of amazing Chinese things from brocade to silk to you know, puppets to whatever bring those to the United States, but by no means in the United States are we lacking things. We're a plural society. We've got Cajuns. We have people, we have amazing people in Vermont. We have Native Americans of, of tribes from all over, the, all over the, of North America. We have incredible things to share, and it's a question of, on both ends of it, sharing all of those things. And so people in smaller regions can say, wait a minute, I get this. Cultural diplomacy includes exchange programs where international groups share food and traditions or use sports to promote understanding and perhaps even reconciliation. It's interesting, you know, you're, you're talking about ping pong diplomacy and of course that harkens back to the Nixon years, but I had the opportunity to interview Jimmy Carter and he always brightens when he, when he talks about this relationship between China and the United States and he doesn't really focus on the things that you would think he would focus on. He talks about Dong Xiaoping and how he wanted to send all these Chinese students over here and how am I gonna deal with that? But then it, how enriching that was, not just for the Chinese students to come here, but for the American students to get to know the Chinese students and learn about their customs, in a sense, exactly what you're talking about. And when you look at that over the years, it makes a huge difference. And I, and I heard a diplomat say this one time, and, I, and it made me think, and I wanna get your thoughts on it. He said, you know, I, it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but he goes, but I could see a time 
where you could have somebody at the White House who went to Stanford University and graduated with the, the head of China who went to Stanford. They were in the same class together. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a possibility that that could actually happen. Um, that's important. That's this kind of relationship that you're talking about, building friendships, learning, understanding, compassion in a way. Exactly. And I think one of the things that, that I found in many years at this point of doing cultural diplomacy is that all of this and what you're talking about with you know, Stanford or UCLA or wherever and you know, people emerging one day and sort of later adulthood as, 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 as national leaders, all of that, those relationships are based on trust. And trust matters here. We don't talk about it that much in the United States. It's not really an overt thing. Um, and I don't think it is in China either, but it's underneath everything, trust really matters a lot. And so let's say that you're living in a dorm with some future leader of China or Albania or wherever, and you, know, you go on to do something similar in, in your own country. The basis for the relationship is, is that you sort of had each other's backs, that you understood one another, that you were kind to one another, that there was a, a, a basis for never really betraying one another in, 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 in moments of difficulty or adversity, that you would stand up for them. And there was always an element of, of respect, of mutual respect and, 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 and similar values. And you know the things that our friendships are based on. And from those, you go away into your life and you come back and you say, my goodness, you know, that man, that woman, that person was my roommate, or we were in a, a club together, or we went sailing, or we did whatever. But they were always decent. I, I knew that I could trust them. Uh, they were an upstanding person, and we found things in common. And I'm so excited that they're there, and that I'm here, because we can talk to each other as professional politicians or leaders or whatever, but based on these really simple human things. So full circle back to Jimmy Carter all the things that matter in that regard, it's the little stuff. You know, it's those small human connections, you know, just leaving aside protocols and treaties and, you know, all of the, the activities and the elements that go along with formal diplomacy. They're those little things that I found in, in, in my professional and, and, and career and my personal life abroad, and doubtless you have as well. It's the small things that, that sustain the relationship. And then those are the relationships that last forever. Yeah, I just last night was in touch on Messenger, on Facebook, with some friends from in, in, in Beijing on Lunar New Year. And these are people that I've known for years at this point. We did a project a long time ago, but we've always stayed in contact. We've watched each other's kids grow up. It's a delightful thing, and we trust each other and we'll always be friends. The little stuff is really it kind is of the, the big The little stuff is the big stuff. Yeah. As the world increasingly becomes interconnected, there's a need for cooperation on a different level. This is where cultural diplomacy becomes significant. You know, one of the questions people always ask when they're getting into a relationship, you and I, what's in it for me? Obviously, that has to be the same question when it comes to cultural diplomacy. What's the answer? Well, it's different things are in it for, for everybody. It just depends on what they do. But, you know, one of the things, you know, we were talking earlier about how, uh, you know, in um, underserved regions, for example, you know, you go to some place that's smaller, they don't really do this, you know, by habit or inclination, and suddenly they're faced with somebody from far, far away. And, you know, you know that there's a thought there, like, why am I doing this? What's the point? You know, there's this, this odd stranger in my office. And that's where, as a cultural diplomat, you need to be a, a really good broker. And uh, the brokerage becomes saying, you have a product that you guys make here in your town, and you've been making it for 1,500 years. And you know, I gather that you want to sell it or market it, find uh, opportunities to you know, get it out of the immediacy. Uh, you run a municipal government. There are places in the United States that would love to meet you, and you could do things together, and you could teach each other. Um, your university might want to have a connection with the university and fill in the blank in the United States. Um, your kids, there are like online platforms and there could be education components that your kids and our kids teach each other about respective things that we share in common. Uh, your businesses could be very excited about this and they could be supportive of a project that would help internally in your, your town or your, your, your city. And it would also you know, find business connections that they can sell their X, Y, or Z in the United States. So there are all of these layers and layers and layers. And it, you know, it depends on where you are and what they do. But everybody can find something. There are these spokes around a cultural project that can be used and effectively.
Experts believe people-to-people -people exchanges, and especially education exchanges, allow for a deeper understanding between Americans and Chinese. Today I will issue a proclamation to better secure our nation's vital university research. But in 2020, the U.S. State Department under former President Donald Trump ended several cultural exchange programs between Washington and Beijing and also revoked the student visas of more than 1,000 Chinese nationals. However, the new U.S. administration promises a more hospitable space for international students. In one of his first acts as president, Joe Biden announced he would be sending a bill to Congress that would make it easier for U.S. university graduates with advanced degrees in either science, technology, engineering, or math to stay in the country. While it will face challenges in Congress, it remains a compelling symbol of the Biden presidency's more inclusive stance towards foreign students. So, uh, final question, you know, in 2020, the U.S. State Department ended five cultural exchange programs <clears throat> with China. This is the closing of the clam, as, as you describe it. Are we, is it going to stay for closed for a time, or do you see it gradually opening? I mean, we have a new administration, or will it open more fully? Because one would think that uh, you can have your differences uh, mm -hmm. as countries, but both should come down on the side of cultural diplomacy is a good <clears throat> thing for both of us. Well, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a perception issue, and this is, it's a historical analogy. But I think for an American audience, it's a, a very relevant historical analogy. I was working um, in the past on a U.S.-China um, history exhibit. It was bilateral history through you know, early photographs, paintings, things going back you know, from the very beginning. And the very beginning for us is, is you know, kind of amusing for Chinese, I'm sure, because our very beginning with China is 1784. You know, it's the Treaty of Paris, we become a country, we can take the British flag off of our ships, and put up the American flag, and go off and go buy things in, in Canton, in Guangzhou. And suddenly we're a trading partner. And so our history in the United States coincides with a really rough period in China. And I didn't really understand that when I began this project. I didn't realize, like, wait a minute, you know, the 1784 onward thing, it's the the hard times, the disintegrative times in the, in the Qing Dynasty. It's the Republic, it's, it's a civil war, it's, it's you know, before that, it's, 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 it's invasions in the Second World War. All of these awful things are happening in China for 200 and something years, um, or a little bit less, but close, you know, while we're this burgeoning new country. And so I think that it's very important you know, for Americans to realize that you know, Chinese interacting with the West, you know, it goes back to, you know, my wanting or not wanting to take the, you know, the you know, summer palace off the list working with the National Art Museum and deciding, well, like, we got to do that. Um, we need to understand our trigger points. Every country has got trigger points. Um, we have plenty of our own. You know, there, there are fault lines that run underneath every single society. I mean, countries are just an agglomeration of borders that are created by some people along the way for historic, you know, cultural, militaristic purposes, whatever. It's just you get California looks like California, but why is it California? You know, it could just be Arizona as well. You know, somewhere along the line of the Gadsden Purchase after the Mexican War, we drew some borders. So. I think that that's really the issue. I think the clam will reopen. But one of the things the cultural diplomats writ large can do is they can also look at the underpinnings of people's potential distrust or discomfort. You know, you guys have always done X, Y, and Z, or if not you guys, the guys who are like you in Europe or elsewhere. And the United States has its own sort of ghosts that we, we deal with, you know, because it's inherent in our, our history. And we can maybe work with each other to discuss those. Those could even be projects. You know, what are we uncomfortable about, and how can we deal? It's conflict resolution. I mean, the State Department's very big on conflict resolution, and uh, I would imagine you know China is as well in, in, in formal terms with public diplomacy. But that could be a cultural diplomacy issue as well. You know, it's like why do we feel this way, and how do we dispel prejudices, preconceptions? How do we get? How do we move forward? So I think that that, for me, that would be a, an aspiration, it would be a hope, of using cultural diplomacy as a way to address the tough stuff as well. Mm, really good point. Curtis, what a pleasure. Thank you. No, thank you too, Mike. This has been great. I really appreciate it.